So, Mike, I kind of want to start with kind of origins of Dark Star. And I'm curious, I read somewhere that Philly Film Festival, you were with maybe Goldblum or someone there. Like, how does this, how does this come about? Sure. Um, so, I, I am a Philadelphian, and I'm from the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, I... A you know, Wharton had, grad, too. You can uh, shout it out. <laughs> well, sometimes, you know, we've had certain, certain people who have graduated there that we have uh, had to disown. But, um, you know, uh, from Philadelphia, there was not a lot of film opportunities in the city. And I was connected with the Philly uh, Film Society who run the Philadelphia Film Festival via Penn. Um, uh, Sharon Pickinson actually came in to do a, um, a talk with a, a course that I was taking there. There actually is a business of film course at, at Penn, which was very unique in my first wow. introduction to the business. Uh, but then I got connected uh, with uh, Breaking Glass Pictures, who yeah. were the, pretty much the only local distribution house in, in town and um, gave me the opportunity to kind of learn the business kind of jump in the deep end you know um, instead of going to work for a studio or going to work for somebody you know some big company where I would be a little fish I was able to get into a small company on the ground floor and really at the advent of digital coming into the business and uh, just kind of learn everything so um, I worked with them for many years and um, in 2017, I decided to go out on my own and start Dark Star Pictures. And uh, at that point, I had moved to Los Angeles, and uh, but I'm still Philadelphia in my heart. And uh, you know that was that was it. I wanted to launch a, a company that was a filmmaker-friendly distribution outlet. You know, we we have a lot of distribution companies in the business that are um, you know out of film festivals buying films and you know kind of out for financial gain, which I guess everyone's in it for money, but. But, um, you know, I really wanted to have a house where filmmakers feel welcome, where things can be very transparent, where we collaborate with our filmmakers, things that you would think would be natural in the distribution business, but unfortunately are not always. So, you know, that's always been kind of my goal and the, the pillars of what I wanted Dark Star to be. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think we've done a good job with that five years into the business now. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I love it. We, we um, you know, we focus on a lot of first time filmmakers. We, we try to push, you know, new voices. We try to push international narratives um, across the board and just really spotlight, you know, filmmakers overall. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of the nutshell of Dark Star starting and, um, you know, my passion around this. It's something I really love. So I'm curious, you, November-ish is when you guys go with the, you know, you're coming out, 2017. Mm -hmm. You guys release a commercial release by February, I'm guessing, the next year. I mean, yes. the turnaround, let's talk about that. But also, post-COVID, y'all are shelling out movies and helping filmmakers like never before. I'm curious, pacing-wise and getting with the filmmaker, what is... I feel like your, your process is so much quicker than other distribution houses. Sure, yeah. We, we So, yes, uh, November... November of 2017 is when we you know, officially started the business in California, registered it. Um, so our first release was uh, in February of 2018. It was a film called Entanglement, um, a uh, quirky sci-fi comedy romance, lots of genre blending. We do a lot of that. Um, and, you know, when we started, we were at a pace of about six, six to eight films per year is what we, you know, what I envisioned. Because, you know, when you are a small team and you're very very white glove with your filmmakers, you know, you can't have a very robust slate of films because you know, there's just not enough hours in the day. And we want to make sure everyone has the proper attention and, you know, campaign wrapped around their movie. We're not a sausage factory. You know, we, we really want to care about these things. So, um, you know, that was a pretty, pretty slow pace to start. You know, now, you know, with COVID, um, kind of theatrical going away, that whole period, transitioning to more like virtual theatrical, um, but also just kind of seeing that there were lots of opportunities in the digital space for um, for these films, uh, and and still being able to you know give each film its proper attention. We were and my team growing. We were able to build up our slate now, and and you know today today we're doing you know 20, 20 24 movies a year. So you know no more than two films in a month um, that are coming out new, uh, but you know a pretty healthy slate and um and it really ranges, you know, it varies. I mean, we have some films that we pick up at the end of their film festival run and they're ready to come out commercially, you know, 
relatively quickly. So, you know, we will get that out in the, in the marketplace and we can be efficient in getting it there, but also not, um, not abbreviating what we need to do to have it out there properly from a marketing perspective. Um, and some films we come on board, you know, from so early on in the process that, you know, it will take a year before it comes out. I mean, we, you know, Runaway Radio, which we debuted here. Um, you know, I was involved with that. Uh, the producer came to me when they had just a couple interviews of, of, of the, uh, you know, what would the film would be and the idea. And I got on board then. So that's been, you know, uh, about 11 months in the process. And we're just debuting here now. And then that will come out in early 2024 commercially, you know, in theaters and then in, in uh, digital. So, um, so it really just depends on the film, right? And how, and how, what's best for the film. If we need to go through a lot of film festivals to build up that credibility, you know, and where we come on, on board in the film's life cycle. Like I said, we never want to be a sausage factory. We want to be... <clears throat> We like to, you know, come up with a, a white glove, you know, handmade campaign for each film uh, that fits the film and the filmmaker, you know, what's going to be best. You mentioned genre bending. Can you talk about, I mean, there's a lot of horror, but there's a lot of sci-fi. There is a lot of wonderful genres that are covered and a lot of mixture of genres. I, some of your films are wild and out there that really are bringing a new taste to the flavor of a genre. Can you talk about finding your films? Sure. Um, well, part of it is I like weird films. Uh, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, personally, you know, I, I, I just, you know, when you look at the marketplace and, you know, you, what you won't see from Dark Star is a lot of dramas. Um, you know, there are dramas, but there are fantasy dramas or, you know, uh, LGBTQ plus dramas, you know, things that are telling an interesting story. And that can also build off of, you know, some core level marketing is so important for our releases because, you know, we are an independent company. We do not have have $10 million to market one film. These are, you know, these films aren't the Avengers. So we need very much to, to find films that have a, have a core audience to lean on, be that the genre audience, be that the um, LGBTQ plus audience, be that the music audience, you know, people who are interested in music films. Um, we've done some political documentaries, you know, where they have kind of a core that we can build off of and then hopefully use that as the foundation of our marketing campaign. Um, and, you know, in terms of finding content, you know, I'm kind Constantly on the road, uh, you know, much to my wife's distaste. Um, uh, well, maybe she likes it sometimes. But, you know, I'm on the road. I go to film festivals all, all across the world, um, you know, looking for those kind of stories, you know, looking at the synopses and, and uh, what, what will fit in to our weird brand of movies, you know. Um, but we really want to, you know, it goes back to that initial concept of, hey, new voices, people who have unique visions, there's nothing more more than that I like more than you know finding something that's just completely unique you know I mean it sits in a kind of a genre of its own I mean we, we released a movie called Jumbo um, during COVID it ended up coming out but we I picked it up at Sundance 2020 so right before COVID started um, and it's about uh, a young woman who works at an amusement park it's a little you know um, a little strange to her friends you know and she falls in love with an amusement park ride and has an actual sexual experience with the amusement park ride and you know a relationship with this amusement park ride so it's a romance and it's a sci-fi and it's like this weird outlier of a film that just exists you know completely by itself to, to a degree you know and and I love like watching that movie you know how do you classify that as genre I, I'm not sure <laughs> still but you know to this day people you know talk to me about Jumbo because it's so unique and so different you know and um, we just always want to showcase that kind of stuff if we can definitely and y'all have done it throughout so it's yeah, great yeah. um you brought up festivals I'd, let's talk to us since it really you know the philadelphia film festival and, and college connection there too i'm curious we're here at sound unseen jim's a part of this and he's brought into your team but i'm curious how important is film festivals especially knowing what happened to many of them during covid yeah film festivals are extremely important um for every level of this business uh you know, some of the studio level people will be more dismissive of film festivals, which is shocking to me because they still use film festivals, even for the biggest films that come out, you know, not Star Wars, right? But like Smile, you know, for instance, a huge hit, you know, that debuted at a film festival, you know, uh, to start. And that it's so important from every level 
level of release. So for us, we you see in kind of how film festivals have faltered a bit with COVID, you know, uh, having to transition to virtual festivals, which is very difficult for smaller festivals, um, and then come back out of that and have people come and be comfortable to come sit in a theater, which is still tough for a lot of people. Um, you know, we, we have you know, decided that we're going to support as many film festivals as we can, not only with our films, which we always have, but, you know, financially if we can, you know, we're, we're, we're interested in, in sponsorships, you know, with film festivals. We're interested in, uh, because of course, selfishly that brings a brand presence to us, but, but we also understand the importance of these things to prop our films up. Um, you know, uh, a, a film like Runaway Radio, which is playing here at Sound Unseen, you know, that's not probably not going to open theatrically in Minneapolis. So we're giving the audience the chance to see it on a screen here via a film festival and that happens all throughout the country in all of these various film festivals so you know we're propping up films you know we're, we're introducing culture you know film culture uh, via festivals to localized audiences which is extremely important and then for me again I can find content at, at these things and you know people always talk about the big ones you know can South by Southwest Sundance you know Berlin these of course these are important festivals where you will find me but we find some of the coolest things at smaller festivals. Fantastic Fest is a big one for us, you know? I mean, it's just here at Sound Unseen, I saw two movies that I'm interested in working on the distribution on, you know, and I'm talking to the filmmakers. So, you know, film festivals are the beginning of every film start, especially when it's an independent film. And uh, we couldn't live without them. You mentioned earlier global. You guys have always gone out of the box to find your films. Yes. How important is it to be a global market and not just concentrate on one area? Yeah, uh, extremely important. I mean, today's, especially with the, the advent of like digital content and it going into other markets, you know, in Europe, the theatrical is still extremely important, you know, much more important than it is here for these smaller films. However, you know, th places like Apple, Amazon, you know, of course, the streamers like Netflix, you know, um, Google, all these platforms are branching out into international territories. We work with them here, you know, and a lot of times our films, you know, don't have a good presence overseas, so we can help bring, you know, those films out into other places. And, uh, you know, no, I, I mean it's 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 great because those audiences get to see the film, but then also, you know, giving the filmmaker an opportunity to be in other in other markets, you know, have exposure, generate revenue, you know, which of course everyone will needs to make their investors whole. But um, you know, it, it's it's to us it's really important from a global cinema perspective. You know, domestically, I like to bring in a lot of foreign film because there are a lot of people here who are not familiar with it, you know, and, you know, in my personal experience, why I've always been interested in this business is, you know, I, I saw, I grew up in inner city Philadelphia, you know, which is very, can be very contained, you know, if you will, and you can have a, you know, you can have tunnel vision into where you are in some of those places, you know, low income family, uh, you know, blue collar family in inner city Philadelphia, not a lot of people in my neighborhood leave that neighborhood. Um, so for me, you know, when I saw foreign film as a, as a, youth, you know, with my dad, um, it kind of opened my eyes to like, wow, there's a bigger world out here. You know, I mean, the one film in particular is The Seven Samurai. You know, I saw that on the big screen and yeah, a three hour black and white samurai drama. And I was 11, 10, and I was just amazed by this movie, you know, like, whoa, what is this? You know, and then that led me down the path of looking at other foreign film, you know, and, and really opening up my world, you know, not only cinematically, but, you know, where where I was as a, as a human being so my hope is is that when we bring different international voices and perspectives we can show that to the other little mics uh, you know <laughs> around 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 the country you know and hopefully open their eyes and maybe you know a kid who you feels like he's kind of trapped somewhere can see something and you know have some hope that there's something bigger I love that. That's yeah. so cool. Um, I'm going to have a fun question for you. I want to have fun with it. I noticed when you came in here, you weren't wearing a Philadelphia Eagles hat. You were wearing a Dallas uh -oh. Cowboy hat. <laughs> How in the hell are you a Cowboys fan, Mike? Uh-oh. This is going to give me in trouble, huh? Uh, I've always been a, a diehard Cowboys fan. Um, I will preface this by saying I, I love the Sixers and I love the Phillies, so sorry, Philadelphia. But the Eagles just, uh, grow, growing up, my, uh, my worst sports house. 
house. My dad is a coach, he, you know, coached all of my teams. And he really disliked the Eagles culture, uh, the, the team culture at that point, which was Buddy Ryan. Um, you know, mean. Yes. Well, he's like, that's not how you treat people. You know, my dad's an old military guy, right? Yes, sir. No, sir. Kind of guy. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, he, and so he didn't like that. So we, we didn't have I wasn't tethered to a football team the same way I was to a basketball team or a baseball team. It also happened to be the 90s. And, you know, there just happened to be some guys named Emmett Smith and most importantly, Michael Irvin. So that Michael Irvin was my favorite player ever. Still is. Um, I love Deion Sanders. I love flashy guys. So I connected with them. So I guess you could say I was started as a bandwagon fan and then I became just a football masochist because the Cowboys have stunk for the last 30 years. So, but I, I've, I've stayed on board and I'm, I'll never not be a Cowboys fan. I'm loyal to my teams. I love it. <laughs> and just to clarify, are you a big Iverson fan then? Of course. Okay, that's all love I wanted Iverson. to make sure. Barkley, I, you know, I'm Joel Embiid right now. So, very cool. I love, I love Philadelphia, just not the Eagles. <laughs> I love it. Well, Michael, I'd, I'd, I'd love to ask about championing the filmmakers you've had over the years because some of your films have come out of nowhere and like have really made differences like Fantastic Fest I think is a great place for Dark Star films I've seen some wonderful like groundbreaking moments there I'm curious getting to see filmmakers take that next step how how much is that fulfilling to you that's why I do this right I mean the 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 whole point you know of championing filmmakers is to help them have their moment find their moment and then continue to have those moments right which I think is really most important um, you know we, we had the um, this year I'm very excited to say we have the, we had the um, the top jury winner of Fantastic Fest a film called Property from Brazil which, which is amazing it, well you know and, and like I, we sent the film to Fantastic Fest we work with Fantastic Fest very closely um, love those that team and you know that the movie was to me I was like is it really a Fantastic Fest movie because it's not straight horror. You know, it is kind of in this outlier place where we like to be, right? Um, it's a thriller, right? But it's about it's about the the socio political system. It's about the class, you know, the class clashes that happen. You know, um, in Brazil, you know, it says a lot about them as a country, you know, and how things are. So, you know, thrilled to be in the festival with the movie, right? And and the movie had debuted at Berlin, which is much more art house than genre. You don't see a lot of genre movies in Berlin. Um, um, so, you know, Daniel, the filmmaker, was thrilled that we were going to get. He's like, look, a whole new audience is going to find my film here. And, you know, this is going to be cool. It's not just the art house audience. This is the genre fans, the fanboys, the, you know, the fun people, the people who are yelling in screenings. You know, we like that. And uh, so then we go on to win it. And now the film is like just crossed over into you know a different world of you know fans for him so you know now we, we have this and the film will come out commercially next year we're still playing a few more film festivals which I'm very excited about but uh, you know now Daniel has a core of fans for the next time he makes a movie you know where he can lean on that he has some festival support from different festivals you know because of course Berlin is prestigious and important but then you have these genre fans in America you know and in and, and a lot of ways that audience is even more important to your commercial prospects, you know, here. So, so you know, he's having this wonderful, you know, kind of opening of his world as a filmmaker to audiences. And it just gives him more, more ability to make different kinds of films going forward and, you know, have an established audience. So, to me, that kind of thing is always what we want to do. We want filmmakers to have, you know, multiple moments, moments they wouldn't think would happen, you know. And... Um, yeah, it's just that's it's the most rewarding thing that you could have in my position. Can I ask about where Dark Star came from? The, the name? Yeah. Uh not the John Carpenter film, which is generally what people people go with the John Carpenter film, or he's a big Star Wars fan, which I love Star Wars, and I love Carpenter, obviously, but Dark Star, the film, is kind of, yeah. Uh, it's a Grateful Dead song. Um, I, I, am a, I am a Grateful Dead fan. I have been my whole life. Um, and Dark Star, this, if you're familiar with the Grateful Dead, Dark Star is, is probably their most exploratory song, because it can range from being a seven-minute or five-minute 
minute song to being a 28 minute version of a song. Ultimate jam song. Exactly. So, and, and to me, a lot of ways it's, you know, how I want the company to be, right? We're, we're trying to explore, you know, we're, we're a jazz company, right? Like we're improvisational in a sense. Like we're, we're trying to see what will work. We're, we are not working within confines of anything, right? We're not saying, okay, we only do genre films. We only do queer content. We only do dramas. We don't do any of that. We try to make sure, we, you know, we try to blend genres. We try to look at weird things that are different and that you maybe have never seen before, just like you might hear sounds in a version of Dark Star that you've never heard before. So, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit esoteric, um, but like as a deadhead, it, you know, I, I thought that that was a really cool connection and also sounds cool. <laughs> It definitely does. <laughs> it looks cool, the logo, by the Thank way. Thank you. Um, I've got to ask, for those wondering, like, what films are out there, can you share with us? You've got a lot of films coming out. Sure. Can you share with us just some of the films? Yeah, so um, some some current ones that we just worked on, uh, I'll, uh, there are a lot, so I'll just go through a couple. Um, we, we recently released a film called King on Screen, which, you know, I was, as a Stephen King fan my whole life, um, I was so excited to, to work on. Uh, which is a, it's a it's a documentary with all of the filmmakers, not all of them because that would be a lot, but a, as many as we could get. Film. Darabont, I mean, big ones. Yeah, yeah. Da we have we have Darabont, we have McGarris, we've got you know um, pretty much everyone except the one we didn't get is De Palma, which as a Philly guy, I'm like, come on. <laughs> but you know, he's a tough interview. Uh, but um, you know, it, it talks about just you know their adaptations of his work. Stephen King is the most adapted living author. Um, obviously, Shakespeare is up there, but he's no longer with us. So, uh, King, so, you know, that's in the marketplace right now. You can watch that anywhere online, um, you know, and it will be coming to, to streamers early next year. Um, we had a theatrical with that in September. Right now, um, we have a film called The Gravity in, in the marketplace, which which um, we, we opened in New York and L.A. this weekend. Uh, it's, it's debuted at Toronto International Film Festival, and it is a French action sci-fi set in a futuristic suburb uh, outside of Paris uh, where the Earth is aligning with the planets in a way that is going to suck the gravity from the planet. All That's the backdrop of a story of two, you know, local uh, gangs who are having a kind of a bit of a turf war. And that's kind of modeled after, um, really after a samurai story, actually. The one big gang together called Ronin. And uh, it's this, like, youth versus the old guard, you know, kind of story that's fun and action-packed. But about PG-13, it's not crazy. Um, while it has this sci-fi backdrop and, you know, the, the gravity is slowly coming from the planet. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. And it's got a lot of cool effects and uh, it was a French production from a really talented filmmaker, uh, Cedric Ido, who um, we're excited, you know, to be working with. Uh, and then, and then we have um, the the uh, South by Southwest Audience Award winner coming out next January, which is called A Place of Our Own, which is you know a um, a really heartfelt um, trans story of you know where the trans community is in the country of India and how it's looked at, which is you know an interesting country because you know they. It, in many ways, they're oppressed. It's an oppressive country for for queer people, um, but they also have a culture that is so heavily wrapped in what we would consider drag, or you know, uh, just culturally, there's a lot of that already. So, so there's a so there's an interesting kind of juxtaposition of you know what is like historically historically existed there is okay, but you know, modern queerness is you know a fo is a faux pas, um, and it, so it's, it, it looks at two women uh, and and the, how they they are struggling with they get kicked out of their apartment and how they find you know solace and in, in each other you know and then find their own community within you know a very oppressive community that exists so um, you know that's a that's another interesting one <laughs> I love your choices yeah. um, <clears throat> excuse me um, I'm gonna ask a you know kind of you probably heard this dark star five years from now ten years from now sure I feel like it's gonna be hopefully very similar but expansion wise how do you look at that. Yeah, um, well, I mean, for, for us, I don't think we will expand in terms of adding more volume. Like, that, that, that that's, even as our team grows, excuse me, even as our team grows and, you know, we become a larger team, we're still not going to be the company that releases 50 movies in a year, because we, we will never be able to have that, that handheld
called effect at white glove treatment. But what I think we will be trying to do more of is, you know, working closer with our filmmakers earlier in the process. So, you know, we want to be more involved in, in production. Um, we're not creatively producing, you know, uh, we want to be a financial outlet, you know, for filmmakers that we, we have worked with, you know, to help them do what they want to do, this, tell the stories they want to tell. And of course, then offer, you know, early market insights into like how to make it com commercially viable, how to make it, you know, work. These are the kind of guiding the festival strategies and things like that much earlier in the process. Um, so I think it's, you know, kind of shifting more um, from only doing finished films into, you know, working more in production um, closer to our filmmakers and then also, um, you know, expanding our theatrical footprint going forward. You know, theatrical is a scary business in this country. It's very much dominated by studios. It's very much dominated by superhero movies, regurgitated remakes, you know, sequels. You know, people love that stuff and I get it. But what we see is, you know, in particular the Gen Z audience now is coming to more theatrical, more more events, right? You look at something like Terrifier 2, Skin and Marink, you know, these are little horror films that have found a real theatrical life. And that's because the younger audience is coming out in droves, you know, putting it on their TikTok and doing an event together. So capitalizing that on that. And I think we have a brand of cinema that can connect that way too. Um, and, you know, we want to expand it to doing bigger theatricals, more robust theatricals. That's giving, you know, again, just giving our films a louder voice, more of a footprint, you know, and a different kind of experience, you know, for people. So, so I think getting involved earlier in films, getting, you know, larger theatrical releases, and then, um, you know, just hopefully just continuing to be, you know, at our core, what we want to be, which is, you know, transparent, collaborative, you know, filmmaker friendly. And um, that's it. It's really about content. I, I think we're very, I'm very content with where we sit, you know, in the marketplace today. Um, you know, and I think reputation goes a long way. Um, and I think we've done a good job of building our reputation, you know, from in the filmmaker community, in the, in the festival community. So, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with the company. I, I think growth is, is only really within kind of our, our reach, if that makes sense. No, definitely. Yeah. Keep that going because it, it matters to the films we've gotten to see. Right. Um, I'd love to kind of end with just... Michael, as far as how people can, you know, find Dark Star, you know, the socials and all that, but also um, if you could just finally share, share just kind of the overall premise of Dark Star, I think it's really important that y'all are filmmaker first. Yes. Yes. I think, you know, Dark Star is and will always be, you know, a, a filmmaker hub where, you know, people, we, we work with content and people who are collaborating collaborative and want to be involved in their films. Independent film, international film, all of these projects are made with passion. And, you know, there's, when it comes to distribution, a lot of times the passion can be sucked from that, you know, because you, you've had all this passion with your filmmaking team, you know, you're all very closely tight knit, putting this together on locations and places, traveling together, you know, eating the same foods, you know, doing all this. And then why is that passion lost? Lost when it comes into the business side of it. We are an outlet for that passion. We we are an outlet for filmmakers, um, you know, to work together with a distribution company. We're not your di distribution company even. I like to say we're a distribution partner because it's a more appropriate word. You know, we want, we always, I always want that to be the case where, you know, you can call me on a Saturday, you know, and get me. You can call me on a Sunday as long as the Cowboys aren't playing. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we want to just most important to us is to carry that passion, you know, from what, how you made the film through your distribution, because that's how you're going to get the best results across the board. You could put a million dollars in marketing into a movie and you can still, that still would not replicate the passion that a filmmaker has for what they've created, you know, and, and what we like to do and what I think we were very good at doing is taking that passion and turning it into press, turning it into, you know, a footprint for all audiences to find something and um, you know there's no no reason we would ever stop doing that and that's that's always that's always been the goal 
Where can people find more about Darkstar? Yeah, you, uh, our website is uh, darkstarpicks.com. Um, and, you know, all of our, all of our uh, hashtags are darkstarpicks as well, but uh, with a PX for, for social medias, uh, I can give you them listed. I personally am not really a great social media guy. My social media manager is going to kill me. But, uh, you know, we're, we're all over. Um, and uh, check us out.